is the story of the Wynn Scale Fire, the UK's worst nuclear accident and also the world's first. We've all heard of the Manhattan Project, a combined effort of America, Canada and the United Kingdom to build an atomic weapon in World War II. At the end of the Manhattan Project, the physicists went back to their home countries. Klaus Fuchs sympathized with the Soviet Union and he decided to give the Manhattan Project nuclear secrets to the Soviets. This act of betrayal really annoyed the Americans. So they passed the McMahon Act in 1946, banning the United Kingdom from the nuclear project. Now I'm originally British and you have to understand why Britain wanted a nuclear weapon. Britain is a tiny island. It has the population of France, but it's four times smaller. Britain has a history of empire and of winning wars. They wanted to sit at the big boys table of nuclear weapons. Atomic weapons need plutonium. Plutonium does not occur naturally and is made by processing uranium into plutonium in what's called a nuclear reactor. In the Manhattan Project, the United States had a facility at Hanford turning uranium into a very small percentage of plutonium. Over the whole Manhattan Project, they only managed to make a few pounds of plutonium, just enough to explode a bomb on Hiroshima and Nagasaki with a bit left over. To make plutonium, you have to have a nuclear reactor. So Britain decided to build a nuclear facility that could produce its own plutonium. A small rural part of England in the northwest of Cumbria was chosen. The site was called Windscale. What they built there was a pile. Now you need to understand the word pile and what it means. It literally is a pile of graphite. When you put metallic uranium near each other, neutrons are released. Very, very fast neutrons. These fast neutrons might just hit other bits of uranium and transform it into other elements. A bit like an alchemist whose job was to transform lead into gold. This is now possible using radioactive elements. But to make the process more efficient and turn more uranium into plutonium, it's better to slow down the neutrons. And the best stuff to slow down neutrons is graphite. Graphite is just carbon, but it's in a crystalline layer. So in charge of the operation was William Penny. He decided to build two piles, wind scale A and wind scale B. Big piles of graphite with holes in it, both going horizontally and some holes going vertically. In the horizontal holes, they would put uranium encased in aluminium, I'm English, aluminum tubes. And these tubes had little cooling fins and that helped them also fit through the holes. The uranium gets hot, releases neutrons, and over a period of a few days, cooks enough of the other uranium in other tubes into plutonium. When that's done, the aluminium containers are pushed out with a scaffolding pipe through the holes and plop into a water bath. They're then extracted from the aluminium casings. The uranium is shredded, dissolved in acid, and a small percentage of it becomes plutonium. The other thing you need to know about these wind scale piles is that they were very concerned about cooling them. Now the ones in America were cooled by water. They were next to a river. Now the ones in wind scale, they decided the safest method of cooling would to have giant fans blowing air through the reactor and up a chimney. Now potentially, if the reactor had a problem, radioactive particles would go up the chimney and spread out over Northern England. So the famous physicist, John Cockroft, 
insisted that they put filters on top of the chimneys and they became known as Cockcroft's Follies. You can see the distinctive shape of the filters even today left on the chimneys. So it was all going along swimmingly, but they were making a very small amount of plutonium. They wanted their plutonium faster. They decided that if they took off some of the fins, the cooling fins of the aluminium, their reaction would become hotter and produce more neutrons and more plutonium. So the fins were partially shaved off and the new reaction happened. On the morning of the 10th of October, 1957, they discovered that the reactor was getting rather hot. Now remember that aluminium melts about 600 degrees Celsius. So you really don't want to melt the aluminium casings. The 10th of October, 1957. What happened that day was to change history. Now there's many films made about the Windscale fire. What actually happened to cause the fire is never really discussed. But today, we are going to involve ourselves in the physics to try and understand why the poor people at Windscale had this ter terrible disaster. A genius Soviet physicist called Wigner realized that when neutrons are released, some of the neutrons will react with the graphite. It's almost as if the neutrons are stretching the graphite, which is a crystal, and, and it holds potential energy. Potential energy, neutrons equals heat. And what the operators found was the reactor was heating up unexpectedly in hotspots. And Wigner suggested a way of releasing this energy by actually heating the reactor up and called a process of annealing. And they'd done this a number of times. And once you heat it up, you heat it up by making the reaction happen a little faster and then you slow it down and the hot spots disappear. On the day of the 10th of October, they had this Wigner reaction. It was getting hot in certain spots. So they did an annealing Wigner release um, procedure and it didn't work. What they thought was, let's do it again. Maybe it wasn't annealed enough and it needs to get hotter. So. They took out the uh, control rods, the reaction got hotter, but unfortunately they noticed that it got very hot. It was up to like a thousand degrees Celsius, which is hot enough to melt the aluminium casings on the uranium fuel rods and something horrible had gone wrong. The shift leader decided to do an incredibly brave thing. He went and looked at the face of the reactor, pulled out one of the inspection plugs, looked in the hole and saw a deep red glow. Possibly something was burning. Now he knew that uranium does burn, aluminium will burn. And remember, this whole thing is cooled by an inrush of air through these big fans that was rushing up the chimney. What could they do? They decided they needed to cool the reactor. So they increased the airflow. Of course, what they didn't know is that by now their reactor was actually on fire. The graphite, just like a charcoal barbecue, was now burning. And the center of the reactor was now a molten ball of melted aluminium, uranium, and graphite that was on fire and it was out of control. Putting more air through the reaction was just fanning the flames and sending particulate matter up this chimney. Thank God for Cockcroft's folly. The filter managed to catch a lot of this burning graphite that if it hadn't have caught would have gone into the Cumbrian countryside and made everything radioactive for hundreds of years. But in fact, the filter did catch a lot of the particulate matter. They called their supervisor. You can imagine the phone call. Hey, Tom, get down here. The reactor's on fire. Tom Tui who is the shift supervisor, came and did the ultimate sacrifice. He walked up a ladder to the top of this cube pile, took off an inspection hatch, looked inside and saw that the reactor was really, really burning. It burnt for three days. 
pumping out radioactivity into the countryside. What could they do to put out the fire? On the same site, they were building a nuclear reactor for power generation called Calder Hall, and they'd just taken delivery of some carbon dioxide. But they tried it, failed, it did not put out the fire. Tom Tui decided that the fans were fanning the flames, so he reduced the power of the fans, and so there was less air going through it, and the fire did die a bit. But it wasn't going out. The most logical solution was to dump water on it. <laughs> but here you've got this enormous risk. We all know water is H2O, hydrogen and oxygen, and the heat and the radioactivity in the pile might well have split the water into hydrogen and oxygen and flames and caused an enormous explosion, blowing the whole place up. If you remember these pictures from the Fukushima disaster, you can see, boom, the hydrogen explosion due to hydrogen being released in the containment building. So they took the horrible decision, turned on the water, and it didn't explode. It put out the fire. The British government played down the whole incident. Milk from local farms was tipped into the Irish Sea and nothing else was done. Amazingly, no one did die on the day of the fire, but it's projected that over 200 people will get thyroid cancer due to the increased radioactivity of the Windscurl fire. The pile is still there. It is so horrible and so radioactive, it cannot be decommissioned until 2037. Even worse, the process produced all these aluminium casings that were being pushed through, split off, the uranium taken out, and the old casings dumped literally into a silo. That building that includes the windscale fire casings is the most radioactive place on this planet. The British government have recently spent millions. They're now on their second project to remove the casings and they have removed none. In an act of PR, Windscale became renamed. It was owned by British Nuclear Fuels Limited and became Sellafield. It continues to be one of the world's largest nuclear reprocessing facilities. It is now aging and has infrastructure problems that need to be sorted out. Well, I hoped you enjoyed this hidden history and found it useful. Remember, the truth is out there.